So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, deploying Python web apps to OpenShift. Uh, I'm just going to show some of the basics of uh, how you can use uh, the source to image strategy in particular to get very quickly get a Python web app in. Uh, and I've been playing around with that and I've learned various things from that and uh, the current support in OpenShift sort of is it's a thing that's still evolving to be improved and what I've been doing is, is working on my own uh, uh, what we call source to image builder images for Python. So I'm going to go into some of the things I've done with that and some of my own ideas of where I think the OpenShift itself should go in that area and how it can be improved. So down further, if you had all got this up and, and it's gone down. Hey Graham, can you increase the font a little bit? Oh, that's right, you're up the back, aren't you? And Graham is also a little modest. He created a modest uh, WSGI server for Python. So you may have heard of that. That's that's not the way to explain it. The way to explain it is I killed this thing called Mod Python. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of deserved to be go away. It was, it was uh, uh, people should not be using it. It's got insec big big security issues in it, which no one really understands and appreciates. Uh, okay. So deploying, deploying applications to OpenShift. Uh, there are three primary ways that one can deploy an application to OpenShift. Uh, the, the first way is that you already have a Docker image already created from somewhere. You could have created it on your own laptop uh, and you've loaded it up to a registry such as Docker Hub. Uh, so you're able to like tell OpenShift that I want to pull that image down and it will just run it up. Um, like any other Docker, Docker image. Uh, if you're talking about OpenShift um, uh, products from Red Hat, uh, then there's certain restrictions that you may find. Uh, we don't like people running as root for various reasons. Uh, so not every single Docker image you find up on Docker Hub can necessarily work. Uh, as long as people are set up so it can run as a non-root user, it should be okay. Uh, the second way is that rather than you build the Docker image yourself, you can effectively point OpenShift at a Git repository which has the code required to build a Docker image, so it's going to have that Docker file in there. And you can get OpenShift to do it on your behalf. Uh, and that saves you having to push images around, which can be really annoying, uh, or using uh, avoids using automated builds on Docker Hub, which drive me absolutely nuts because they don't work half the time. Um, and the, the third way which is one can do it is that rather than build a Docker image at all yourself, you can what's called source to image, uh, which we'll call source strategy. And the idea with this is that someone will build a base image for Docker, which has all the bits and pieces in it to require for programming in the particular language you're using. And, and today we'll be talking about Python. And uh, what happens is that OpenShift can be you point it at your source, your Git repository again, but in this case, what's in your Git repository is just your web application code. And <coughs> OpenShift, will, when it runs up the builder, will pull that Git repository down, essentially incorporates it. It's going to create a new Docker image for you, and that's so you don't have to know about how to do Docker images yourself. We'll pull that into a new image, which is built from that base image, <coughs> the source to image base image. And We'll look in that source repository, and in the case of Python, we'll um, install packages and so on, and, and create your final image for you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, the source to image one in this. I'm not going to do the, the other ones, uh, so mainly just in the, the, the Python source to image. Now, I've got uh, various web applications up for uh, that I'm going to be using up on my, my Git repository. Uh, I'm going to focus on a Django web application. And I've created that by essentially just creating a fresh <laughs> repository. I've done a Django start project and uh, created a basically Hello World app. Um, it's not much to it. I've not done anything special for it for OpenShift. Uh, so we're just going to go through here. Now, most of the notes here talk about things in terms of doing things in the command line. Um, but I'm actually going to jump first into the, the web UI and quickly show you uh, how it will be done there. So if I just copy the URL for my app. And, 
oh, I need to create a project first. So if you are following through, you need to create a, I'm using user 00, so if you do have the existing account, and sorry, we didn't talk about giving anyone else any user IDs. Um, Great. So these are all the source to image builders that uh, exist in the OpenShift installation we're using. There may be some quick start apps in there as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for the Python one. Uh, I'm going to select a particular version of Python here, Python 2.7. I'm going to call this Django. Hello world and give it my git url. Um, there are some uh, uh, more other options you can go here and set um, and one in particular I'll point out is this thing down here which is the routing. Uh, there's actually a slight little difference between when you do things through the UI whereas you do it on the command line. Uh, if you do it through the UI it by default will expose your web app automatically to the public internet uh, whereas if you do it from the command line that's a separate step. Uh, Used to confuse me no end, I, I would keep forgetting that. So we're going to create this. And that's going to go off and start deploying. So what that's doing now is that's pulling down that Git repository, uh, creating a new Docker in which incorporates that source code. And that's what we call the assemble phase. Uh, it's controlled by this assemble script that's part of the source to image builder. It's the thing that's going to uh, Go look at the requirements.txt file in your Git repository, which has a list of all the Python modules you need. It's going to go and install them. Uh, in the case of Django, it's going to, uh, or it's going to realise you've got a Django app by looking at what the code is, and run Python manage.py collect static, which creates all those static files which you need in the Django app for the admin interface and any other things you're doing. And that's going to take a little while. So we can look at what it's actually doing. We hope it's doing something. Uh, <laughs> so the first time you actually, uh, there's the first one thing is, um, which is really annoying for demos, is that the first time you use an image in a, a, a cluster, it also has to get it down from Docker Hub. Uh, that shouldn't be doing that because I've done it in a separate project. So maybe it's happening because I'm in a separate account. I did it in a different account last time. Anyway, while that's going on, uh, let's instead do it on the command line. So the case of the command line, I'm already logged in. So I've got all these different projects here. I need to be in the correct project because I'm most likely in the wrong one at the moment because I just created it. And what we can actually do here first off is even look at uh, what that other one is doing. So it's, it's still waiting for the build. So because I did this in, a, in a, a different account to what I was testing on it earlier, it looks like it's having to build, pull down that image from um, uh, somewhere first. Actually, it's a built-in image, so it shouldn't. So hopefully there's not a problem going on here. So this time I'm going to create with the command line. Um, now, interesting distinction here. When I did it from the UI, I specifically chose that I wanted to use Python in a particular version. And here, when I've done an OC new app, uh, I have just given it the Git repository and nothing else. I haven't told it it's a Python app. Uh, and what's happening here is the OC new app has some smarts in it that when it gets down that Git repository, it will actually look inside of a Git repository and try and determine what language you are using. So in the case of Python, it's going to look for whether you have a requirements.txt file, which is going to be the list of modules to be installed by pip, or it has a setup.py file, which is an older way that um, used to be used back before pip became popular as a way of, of installing a package uh, application as an actual package itself, and you can have your, your dependencies listed in there. Uh, so in this case, it's sort of knows because I've got a requirements.txt file in there which is listing Django that it was Python and it's going to go and fire off Python for me. Um, what How it uh, will find out if it is Python 2 or Python 3? Okay, that's what I was about to mention. So, uh, OpenShift installation exists now, supports Python 2.7, 3.3 and 3.4. No 3.5 yet. Uh, 
And the free four image essentially is tagged as being the latest. So if you go and do a deploy, it's going to just use whatever is the latest one. And so in this case, it's going to be using Python 3.4. Uh, the alternative is if you know that you want a particular version, uh, is it Python 2.7 or? Might be a dash. You reckon it's a dash? Here, I got it in my notes down here. So Python language protection. Yeah, uh, no, Python colon and 27. So, yeah. So that's why you can actually select a particular version. And, and we're going to actually um, use that ability. So essentially what we're saying here is here's our source code. And this is the particular builder that we want to use. In this case, it's Python 27. And, and we'll use that later when I start talking about uh, different uh, builders and, and replacing the, the, the default one. So let's see how this thing is going. Okay, so our original one's up. Oh no, it's a. Oh, that's interesting. Our our original one is still <coughs> going for some reason. Um, but the one we just created is is fine. So let's look at the one we created. And and here is what I meant. Is that you look at the top one here. It's got a an e, a. This is going to be the actual URL. And it's running very slow. Um, because we had the previous uh, workshop running, maybe someone's been doing some interesting things with uh, scaling up a lot of instances of an app and it's all running a bit slow. We'll see how we go. Um, so that one had a URL, exposed URL already. This one didn't. So because we did it from the command line, uh, we're going to need to expose it. And that's done using this OC expose. So we expose the service. And let's see if we can get to this one. Yes. And for Django app, if we go to admin, you'll see that the admin works. We have style sheets working. Um, so our static files are also being hosted automatically. That one must just be broken, which is a pity. Now, what I want to do next is I want to talk a bit about application deployment workflow because it's all well and good that you can get an app up there, but what does that mean to the way that you're going to work day to day? Now, it doesn't change it too much in perspective in relative to how you're used to just doing database development. Um, with Django, you've got the development server, which is built in. So nothing changes there. If you're going to work on this thing, you still make your changes, use the Django development server, use the fact that you can do code reloading to automatically pick up changes if need be, and nothing's going to change there. But we still need to get our changes up to uh, up and deployed publicly. So publishing your code changes. Um, we created this originally against the Git repo, so obviously you're going to check that out. So the workflow is basically do your local development with Python Django development server. When you're happy, commit your changes and push them up to the Git repository. Uh, now, if you're familiar with uh, OpenShift V2, uh, the, I find that the way how V2 worked a little bit confusing actually, because you could just create your Git repository locally on your disk. Uh, well, actually, OpenShift itself and effectively was running a Git repository for you, um, Git server, like a GitHub inside of OpenShift. And so when you created your app, there's a few things that could happen, but generally you created your app in OpenShift and then checked that out and then started making modifications in that. Or alternatively, you um, could do that initially, but you might already have an existing app. So you've got all this funny messing around with, with changing it to then push to OpenShift and do a force push initially to update it. But anyway, the thing is that to do deployments previously in V2, you would do all your code changes, commit it, and you would push them direct into OpenShift. And that would cause your web app changes to then actually be deployed. Uh, in OpenShift v3, you've told it where your GitHub repository exists or whichever other public or private repository it's linked to. And you're instead of pushing your changes direct to OpenShift, you're just pushing it to your normal repository. And at this point, there is no linkage between that repository and OpenShift. 
That means that if you do want to trigger a new deployment based on code changes, then you have to trigger a build. And that can be done on the command line using uh, OC start build, or you can do it through the UI. And I'm, I'm really hesitant to uh, trigger any if this is going to... Um... Well, that's it. This has failed, okay? And I, I'm, I'm going to assume it's a timeout. Can you try see this well, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a timeout. Yeah, this is the, the problem we've been seeing um, occasionally on our own cluster. We hadn't seen it on this one we're using for the demos. But let's use that fact. We can go in here and go build. So if you've made a change, I can go over here and go start build. And that's going to pull down the latest version of the source code from the Git repository, um, build you a new image, and deploy it. And that all happened. Uh, so that's a manual process. But what we can do is that. I'll skip that bit. Um, we can use what's called webhooks, and uh, we talked a little, Grant talked about this a little bit in the previous workshop, and I, so I wasn't going to go into depth with it. But the idea here is that you can get what's called a webhook URL from the configuration in OpenShift for your, your project or your application, and you can set up GitHub with that webhook. And what that means now is that every time that you commit to the Git repository up on GitHub, it will automatically notify OpenShift that there's a new version of code there and that will automatically trigger a build. Uh, so you get the same effect as what you could do in OpenShift v2 of when you did a push, does a change, it's just going in a different way. It's going via where your Git repository is this time rather than direct into OpenShift. <coughs> Let's see how our build's going. Yeah, this time it works. So we've got two, two deployed apps. <coughs> Yeah, we're going for time. Now, what about if you don't like the fact that to get this now deployed, I'm having to always commit my work and push it up to GitHub. Uh, if you're doing lots of little changes, uh, like you've done all your work presumably with Django Development Server, but you get situations where your deployment environment is a is going to be different to your local development environment. And so sometimes you can have a problem uh, where you can't replicate an issue you're having in your local development environment. You can only see it occurring in your actual deployment environment. And in that sort of situation, what you is a pain is having to make a little change on your repository, do a commit, and wait for the uh, build to occur, and then find, well, that didn't quite work. I'll go and make another change, do another commit, and if when you do that, you end up with all these little commit history in, in your Git repository, and some people don't like that sort of little trail of all those commits. Um, you could uh, do rebasing and squashing and all this sort of nonsense, and I personally don't like that. So the alternative of what you can do is um, what's called a binary... Well, you make use of the fact we've got a binary build. So you've got your application already set up, and when you, we did that start build previously, it's going to cause... OpenShift to go back to your Git repository. Now what we're going to do this time is, is circumvent that process. And we've got this command here, OC start build. We're going to build our particular thing again. We're going to say, but take the source code from our current directory on our local box instead of from Git. So let's, uh, where's that? Which one will we use this one? So I've got my hello world. They should make that change. Now, I have not committed this, and I'm going to. Ah, uh, I shouldn't cut the paste, should I? Okay. So this uh, this time, what's happening is rather than getting the source code repository source from the remote Git repository, it's bundling up the directory in which I've run this, and it's going to push that into OpenShift. And this time, the build is coming from there. So let's see if we can see how long this one's going to take. So this you can see where the build's happening. Let's just dump it over the UI. It's probably just easier to watch over there. So that's already built. It's spun up that new one. Um, just a warning. Uh, the default at the moment is this is using Django Development <laughs> Server. 
And I don't know what it is about Django <coughs> Development Server, but it doesn't respond to uh, SIG term properly, and it's taking 30 seconds to shut down. That's why we're seeing here. But our app's already running. That should have been taken out of the routing. So we should now be able to go over here, and there's that change. So I never put that up to the Git repository. So that's one way that one can do it. And let's try another way. Now, that doing it from the current directory only affects that one current build. If we were to trigger another build, it'll go back to using the, the Git repository. It's not a permanent, permanent linkage. So if you're happy you've done the right thing, you can go commit that, push up, start a new build, and I'll go to Git repository. <coughs> Next thing we could do is live source code changes. Uh, so what we're going to do this time is you can actually get into the running container. Now, if you're familiar with, uh, say, for example, Heroku, there was an ability with Heroku to get access into a dyno, but it was a special dyno that was the... A, run up just for your shell access. It wasn't the one where your web app was running, so you couldn't do live code changes. Uh, in OpenShift, you can actually get the information about which particular pods are running your app. And in this case, we've only got one. Um, if you have more than one, this gets a bit difficult. Uh, we've got one. We can actually get inside of that running container and make code changes. So here's our running app down here. So I'm inside my container, and for some reason I always have to set terminal. So there's my modified one. <coughs> oh, I use this at capital C. And there's my change. Now that has worked because it is using the Django development server inside of the container as the default. Uh, that's one of the things I'm not necessarily totally happy with the, the default builder um, because using Django development server, if you uh, do Django, that is not a production great server. You should never use it um, for various reasons. Um, it's obviously not going to be performant. It's a single process with a single thread. And, and yes, with OpenShift, you could scale up and create more instances with one process and get currency that way, but not a, not a good situation. Uh, and that's good. Now, there's yet another way we've got of working more with this. And uh, Grant touched on this in the previous workshop. Um, so we can do a, a build which is triggered from our current directory. We can get into the pod and do stuff. The other option is this, in OpenShift, it's this OCR sync. It allows you to actually make all your changes locally on your box and essentially just R sync that change code directly into the running container. So let's get this one to go. So we, what are we on? We're still on capitals. Get out of here. What letters will we use this time? Yeah, Zs. <laughs> so, get pods. So I'm going to rsync this subdirectory which has my app in it. I need to specify the pod. Now, you do need to know where in the... I'm bound to get that wrong, so let's just check it. Opt at root source for their world. I think got it right. Uh, how do you know which pod to pick? You need to re re ah. replace the uh, apt to t with a p. Uh, opt slash apt minus root. Go to the left. E -P -P. More left, more left, more left. Stop. And oh, okay. And there, okay. So let's bundle up that directory, push it up there. Um, because it's rsync, uh, our images have rsync. You've got, uh, there was a question on how do you know which pod to use. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so in this case, I've done an OC get 
Can you see that right down the bottom? Let me do it again. Um, there are different types of pods. There's the ones which actually have your running app, and you'll see these other ones which are the build pods, and you'll see ones that pop up with deploy. Uh, so it's a case of just, um, you, you sort of understand, learn it over time, which is the one, but we've got that one pod there of, of that. Uh, there's other ways of doing it. Uh, OC describe... I'm doing it from memory here now, so I'll probably get this wrong. Oh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Is it service or replication control? <laughs> oh, anyway, there's, there's other way of doing it, but... Um, yeah, I'm doing it that way, so I'm selecting it from there. Uh, now, someone said that, yes, that failed, or it appeared to fail. Um, I've got the wrong one, have I? App root? <coughs> I must be giving it the wrong directory then. Let me just cut and paste that bit. Okay, interesting. So, Greg, you have two <laughs> pods in a running state. The first one, the 32C47H, and then the one on the bottom. What's the difference between those? Oh, that was the one I created with the web app earlier. Uh, That's not the one I'm using now. Um, this is, this is one thing about uh, doing R syncs that um, is important. Our builders are set up for this one. You need an R sync uh, command in there, but all the permissions have to be set up in a way that when you do make changes in the pod, you can actually do them. Our, our ones are set up to do that. If you take an arbitrary Docker image off uh, Docker Hub and try and do this, it may not work because the permissions may not uh, may be set up as root or something, but it's running as a non-root user, so you might be able to do it. Um, I can't see exactly what the problem is there. I think it works. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you're right. It's, I've done it once before, um, and the that first time we saw all the files changed. Yes, this is only on the directory, and I, I need to talk to someone about why this occurs, um, but I have noticed this. It, it can't access, update permissions on just the directory. All the files get updated, but get this strange message. <clears throat> now Grant gave an uh, interesting example in the last talk. Uh, what Grant does is actually sets up his editor so that whenever he saves a file locally, he will automatically go and uh, update all these things. And one of the questions was, how do you find the pod? Uh, and actually, here is, here is the way that I came up with. I've got this little script here. Uh, so you can actually use the OC get pods command and use what's called a selector. So I'm going to select just the pods which are for my particular application. Um, and I'm going to ask just for the name of the pod. Uh, and now I'm on the basis that I'm only going to have one single pod. So I'll get my pod name like that. And then I'm going to feed that into the asking command. So you could, if you're in an editor environment, uh, Set your, set your editor up so you could run this little script and, and just give it the, the name of the app, where you're going to do it from, with however the editor works that out, and wait, what your destination is. And, and that way you could trigger it off, off doing it off the editor. Oh, does anyone tell me when this is meant to finish? We've got ten more minutes? Yes. Um, so that was one of the key things I wanted to talk about in, the, in this one, is the different ways you could work with it. Um, because, you know, people look at the, the look at OpenShift and already pass like that, and they think they have to change their workflow around totally, uh, and just do everything in a much, much strange way. You do, there are some things which are different, but the basic things still work, like the development server, um, and committing and so on. You're still doing all that, but you can try and set up those workflows, your web hooks to try and automate things, and you do have these, these ways of doing live changes still, you aren't precluded from doing that, which uh, a lot of people think, oh, well, I can't make live changes anymore, but you can. Okay. 
Um, now a bit more about the default uh, Python builder, and we'll, we'll finish up there uh, after that. Um, so it's doing a lot of automatic things here, and like magic is good when it works um, because you don't have to think too hard. You can just get your Git repository; uh, it'll hopefully just deploy it, and you don't have to worry about it. Now, what the the default builder currently does is it goes through a strategy. Uh, a few different steps and try and work, work out how it's going to deploy things. And the first thing it will look for is whether your repository has an app.py file. And in that case, it presumes that you are going to supply the whole Python web application. So in this case, you might, for example, be using Tornado um, async server or something other. So you actually have your Python app.py, it's importing the Tornado module files, setting up all your handlers and basically running it. Uh, or you, or you could, uh, uh, even, even though you're using Tornado, still be using Whiskey app, but just using it, uh, its Whiskey container. Uh, the next thing it will do is if you've got Goonicorn installed, so if you in your requirements.txt file have installed Goonicorn as part of your packages, uh, it will go through and look and see whether you have a Whiskey.py file somewhere in your repository, uh, which is the going to be containing the Whiskey application entry point. And if it finds that, it will run up Goonicorn against you. Uh, so you haven't had to define how the server is actually started up. Uh, finally, uh, if you have a manage.py file, it assumes you're running Django, and it will just reuse Django uh, run server. You don't have to define, but you can define how the service is going to be run? Yeah, that, that's one of my issues with the, the current def default builder at the moment. Uh, that's a bit difficult to try to override everything. Your, your only options are basically Goonicorn or an app.py file. And that means if you run a one to run you whiskey, for example, you would have to have an app.py file which does an OS exec help of your whiskey binary, which is a bit strange. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the other thing is it, it, uses, it does push you towards Goonicorn, uh, which me personally, okay, I'm bi very biased because I wrote my whiskey, uh, but I have very good reasons for thinking that Goonicorn is not necessarily a good choice for. Uh, containerized environments. Uh, it's, it has only single uh, request worker per process, uh, which means if you need to scale up, you have to create more processes, which means more memory. And in a PaaS environment, uh, yes, you've got to worry about issues about Python global interpreter lock, but you've also got memory constraints. And, and so having to scale through using model processes is not necessarily good. If you've got an IA-bound app, it's often better to scale using Freddy because uh, the gill is not a problem. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the reasons I'm not too keen on the Goonicorn. Um, so I'll flick all past this. So alternative Python S2I builds. So OpenShift does provide a default, but you don't have to use it. You could write your own S2I builder if you wanted this style of environment. Um, you might just say, oh, okay, I don't want to do anything to do a source sort image and just build your whole Docker image from scratch if you wanted it. And most pe people out there, that's what they're currently doing. Uh, but source to image is good because, it, especially if you're coming from a DevOps background, because you can say to the developer, uh, you just need to worry about writing your app. Um, here's the, the S2I builder you can use. Now, it may be default, or they may have developed their own one. And that allows them to incorporate in that builder image all the things that they as ops people want to see in there. Um, that may be, uh, for, so for, it might be a particular Python whiskey server that they want to use. They might want m monitoring um, such as New Relic embedded in there to do monitoring. They can set all that up automatically so you as a developer doesn't, don't care. Uh, now, obviously, I'm keen on mod whiskey. Uh, so I've been playing around with my own Docker images for uh, quite some time. Uh, I only started with Red Hat uh, middle of last year. Um, yeah, last year. Um, and I was doing it before that. And since obviously you got into Red Hat, I've taken my existing image, I've sourced the image and uh, enabled it, and I've been playing with it. And my latest incantation, I'm just going to show you where, um, where I'm at with that. Uh, OK. So this is where I'm going with my image. And I, I sort of, um, same issues you're mentioning is, what if you want to take over control? Because uh, I want to be able to do that. So I provide a lot more options in my image 
And the idea is that I've done this and I'm talking to the people, other people in Red Hat are developing the default and I'm trying to get them to do changes to incorporate some of these images so we can improve on it. Uh, so the default one's better, but also you still have this option externally. And I'm, I'm sort of hoping that with my one, um, because I want to do things that Red Hat would never want to do in theirs. Um, I like use source tables for Python, so you can have the latest versus packaged, for example. I'm hoping to get community interest in uh, my image and perhaps get web community cooperating to have a web community managed one. And that way we can come up with a best of breed one. Uh, and that'll be an option. In OpenShift, do you have the possibility to choose a, a default? Do you have more defaults? Could you create profiles, for example, in OpenShift, and you can choose what defaults you would like to have? Or Python, for Okay, see, the only default that really exists is that if you use OC new app on the command line and don't tell it to use the Python image, it'll do that language detection. In that case, it then, once it sees it's Python, will look for uh, what we call the image stream, which is essentially a Docker image, um, for called Python. Now, if you wanted to use that language detection, but uh, but didn't want to use the default, then you can create a image stream local to your project, which maps Python to mine, for example. And that way, you could override it. Um, hopefully, that works. I, I found an issue with it in the last version. I'm not sure. I haven't tested it in the one we just released as to whether. That overriding does work, uh, but that's the idea. So, mm -hmm. but besides the language detection, you're going to generally specify the builder you want to use anyway. It would be nice in, if in OpenShift you have the possibility to choose when you customize your project, choose maybe some things. Yeah, and the only way is to override the, the Python yeah. image stream. That's probably the only way I can see you do it. Uh, so, in my image. Uh, if you want to use your whiskey, or just totally control, you want to run any command line whiskey server, uh, I allow you to provide an app.sh, um, so shell script, and you can run whatever you want, however you want it. Uh, it looks for an app.py, uh, it looks for a paste.ini file, if you're using paste or um, with pylons or pyramid, which you use, we use that sort of thing. And you, it will just go and automatically run up. So it, I'm using Mod Whiskey Express there uh, to do that. Um, that's sort of, if you're not familiar with it, it's a bit different to straight Mod Whiskey. So Mod Whiskey Express, a little bit of confusion over it. Mod Whiskey Express is, you, to install that, you basically go pip install Mod Whiskey. Um, and it's not, any, it's not this totally new Whiskey server I've written. It's still Mod Whiskey. But what Mod Whiskey Express does is just generate all the Apache configuration for you on the fly. So you don't have to do it. So you're relying on the fact that I know how to set up Apache and probably going to do it better than what the default config is that you'll find on your your, your operating system which is generally set up for, for PHP. Um, so nothing special about it, it just saves you a lot of effort. Um, I look for whiskey.py file um, and if you come from OpenShift 2, uh, the default builder sort of doesn't have a sort of upgrade path. My one I've been fiddling around with, it, it will sort of uh, Look, do some of the things that OpenShift V2 did with knowing that if you've got a whiskey slash static directory, it's going to be static files, I'll mount that as slash static. Uh, or if you've got a whiskey application file, it's actually whiskey.py file equivalent. So I'm trying to do that, that equivalent so we can have an upgrade path. Uh, setup.py file again, look for, uh, and a manage.py. Um, so manage.py is Django, but the important thing is I'm not using Django development server here at all. Um, it will actually query using manage.py to find out what the configuration of your Django app is and automatically run it up under ModWizky Express. So you're going to have a production grade server in all of this. Um, how are we going for time? One minute. Um, so very quickly then, to get to the, that question of uh, taking control. Um, so by default, it works in an order mode. So I'll look for shell, pi, shell app .shirt, app .pi, paste, or Django. That works in an order mode. I'll generate all the stuff. But yes, if you want to take control, you can instead set in a particular file. I want to use Goonicorn, or I want to use Mod Whiskey, or, or Waitress, or U Whiskey. And in that particular case, when you do that and you're taking control, 
then it's up to you to provide all the configuration. Um, and I've got various examples there, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, if you go to the page, there's various examples you can dig around there. There's a particular file which is set called uh, uh, warp drive server uh, uh, server type. Uh, do I see it there mentioned? No. Okay, so there is this uh, dot warp drive server type, so that's where you can specify what it is. If you need to override and, and circumvent the algorithm of what, what it chooses. Uh, and there's a server args file, so what it will do is that uh, you've said you want to use Goonicorn, but you don't have to run Goonicorn. I'll run Goonicorn for you, and I will supply the minimum options that are needed to Goonicorn or UWSGI or Waitress to have it work properly inside of the Docker container. Uh, so it'll set up logging to ensure it goes to stood out. Uh, it'll bind on the correct port for listening to connections. Uh, all those sorts of things will all, the minimum will be done for you. But after that, you then have to provide the options you need, telling it where your app is and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, you can dig around here um, on, the, on the Git repo. Uh, there's lots of other things that my, my uh, builder can do, which the, the others can't do, which I think is, is more useful, being able to configure it for environment variables and change uh, various things like that. Uh, our mod Whiskey Express still has an auto-relating node, so you can enable that if you still want to do live code. Do Any questions? I talked too fast, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I had that issue when I came over here. It seems my Australian accent has, uh, does cause confusion for some people of being able to understand it. The static files are also handled through this uh, whiskey. In my case, with Mod Whiskey Express, uh, it because it's actually is starting Apache, and Apache can handle static files very well. Uh, then yes. It, so what will happen is that you can point at a, a directory of static files. The Apache part will do that, and your Python web will have, be happen, uh, handled by Mod Whiskey, and. If you're familiar with mod whiskey, there's two modes. There's an embedded mode and a daemon mode. Uh, daemon mode is always the one you should use, even though it's not the default. But mod whiskey express will always use daemon mode for you. Thanks, Graham. So that's that link up there if you want to quickly write it down. <laughs> So, uh, just on it. so what does in that process you start another code uh, or you decide you're starting a patch and you write it on how is that happen? Because I'm like, I've never done a shift, I was like, plus you with an activist. So, and I'm writing, you know, like just a code. When I use your work drive, it means like, uh, are you leaving? Yeah, and a bit tired, okay. but it's okay. But so you don't have to fiddle around. That's always the case, man. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. How long are you going to stay here? Oh, actually, I came on Monday because we were having the time. Ah, yes, yes, yes. 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 Uh, okay. Actually, it was all running for the Docker image. So, the so, so, the so it's two weeks straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 10 days for that. Oh, God. And hey, when are you leaving? No, that's just oh, doing all the commands. Uh, well, Sunday night. Sunday night. Yeah, because my flight is so busy. And the program that drives it goes to Vienna. It's assembled. Oh, from Vienna. Yeah. I live now in Malaga. And then you've got Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been there one day. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I went there and then went to Nefka. Yeah. 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 And then to Granada. So, yeah, nice places. Yeah. Don't tell me now. <laughs>
I want to go to the You are always welcome. Oh, yeah. We, we didn't actually, we didn't come to Spain for a while. But it's on the street, you see, you want to stay there for a while? Oh, yes, I'll call you. <laughs> to at least give me some places where I can eat and have some fun. What? See you around. to go and see you around? I think you should put my hand. Go on. And Mother Whiskey, in this case, is actually in the package. Forking out a visa process to run the VSP app and the trial worker process is actually just popping. So I'm setting up all those connections. <laughs> have a contest real quick. What year was Open Shift first released? Which one? The first one. The first one was released. Open Shift one. Okay, let's, let's change. <laughs> what year did Open Shift online go GA? This year? No. <laughs> Any other guesses? Three years ago? Three years ago, 2012. When the Earth was formed. Three years ago, good enough. What size do you wear? Large. Steve, you got any other trivia questions while we're waiting? What? Ask another question. On the spot like that? Yeah. What are you doing? What is the open source version of OpenShift called? Origin. 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 <laughs> what size do you wear? <laughs> what size? Um, Excel, I think. Excel. <laughs> this is the shirt I'm wearing. If Steve asks more questions, I'll get more t-shirts. I'm trying to think of the three questions as opposed to your questions. So I'm going to put it in the what country is Jorge from? Spain! <laughs> How do you know? What? Where I'm from? Do I know you? No. <laughs> but I know you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, so what is the national animal of Poland? <laughs> Buffalo. What? Buffalo. The eagle. eagle. It's a bird. There's a hint. Eagle. Eagle. What? What? Eagle. Type? Okay, great. What? A little bit more specific. Uh, what? The color. You gotta get the color right. Black eagle. Black eagle. Black eagle. Red eagle. Red eagle. What are you talking about? Who said white eagle? He said black eagle. Well, well then he black. doesn't get a shirt. Who said white eagle? I heard someone say white eagle. White eagle gets the shirt. <laughs>
Is mythical. On the Phoenix. Wrong. No one gets a shirt. What's the national mammal of Finland? What? Wolf? National Moose? Mammal. No. National animal, the national mammal. So I'm, not, I'm excluding the birds. I'm giving those people who don't like birds a chance. Gosh, that, no. Who would pick a reindeer as a national animal? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to step all over us and investigate us. They think of people, when they think of countries, they think of something strong. What is the national animal of Finland? A bear, a brown bear. Yes. And brown bears are long, everywhere. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep it in Europe just to make, try to make it easier for you. <laughs> Although, obviously, this is not working. <laughs> Where is the largest red-headed cherry office? <laughs> Grant! You're the good, you're the good cop and I'm the bad cop. Okay, I'm going to find another Steve, ah. Steve, can I start? I don't know, I'm on t-shirts, why are you looking at me? Because you are talking. Grant is the one who keeps up. Ask him if he's done. Okay. National Animal of Netherlands. Unicorn. Who said unicorn? <laughs> Go ahead. Anyone? There's nobody from the Netherlands? What? Yes! Okay. What size? Yeah. Alright. Can we do that during the break? I'm not doing my time. People want t-shirts more than I know. Yeah, I know. I know. <coughs> what is the national animal Stay. of media? Enough. Please. Oh, we're starting? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see Grant come back here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, you got a heads up to the next question. Though. Okay. So, for the next 40 minutes, 30 minutes, if I'm fast and you'll have time to, for questions, I'm going to talk to you about uh, building your own origin. Origin, as you just said, is the upstream for OpenShift. Who I am? I'm Jorge Morales. As somebody said, I'm from Spain. I don't know how he knows, but I'm from Spain. You can guess it. Once I start talking, you can guess it. Until I start talking, probably it's not, because I'm old, probably I'm from any other country. This is my picture, so if you reduce my presentation, you have to modify it at least. Okay. <laughs> Where do I work? I work at Red Hat. Of course, this is a Red Hat conference, so we are here, most of us, we are here at Red Hat. And what do I do for a living? I work as a developer advocate for OpenShift. That's why we are here talking the whole day about OpenShift, and I just invite you to join all the other sessions around OpenShift. <coughs> what do I do mainly for a living? I do demos, workshops, talks, conferences, blogs, and travel. We travel a lot every day on the road. But the good thing about traveling is that we drink beer, we meet people, nice people, and we are in countries with nice weather. Not this one, but with nice weather. <laughs> okay, let's go to the top. <coughs> I wanted, what we wanted, I wanted was an open shift in the VM, in a VM for doing my talks, conferences, workshops, whatever. Okay. So I, start, I started doing some research on what was available when I joined the team because I'm very new to the team. I'm only here for six months and I start doing some research of what was available at that time. There was a whole lot of options. So I start, I went through all of these options. The first place to look, of course, it was the official origin um, repository. They have a background file to allow you to create a, a VM. It was community version. It was maintained, obviously, continuously. They are working on it, so it's always up to date. But for me, it had some cons. So it, it only set up the VM. So there was a lot of manual steps to do in order to have a full OpenShift origin <laughs> VM working or process working. It was not easy to update. There was a lot of scripts that they are here in a hack directory. And there is a lot of stuff uh, that wasn't simple. You need some code redirection to access your, to your application. And there wasn't too much documentation. Why? Because engineers don't like to document. <laughs> so they know how to work. Why? Because they chat in the IRC. They know each other. They see the side. One and the other, they know how it works, but for external consumption, it wasn't easy. There is another, another uh, VM or, or effort to create a VM that's also from Red Hat, which is the Container Development Kit. That is something that we are creating to allow developers 
to interact with, uh, with OpenShift. As we are developer evangelists, we want the developers to work with OpenShift, so this seems like the best approach or the best option for us. But one of the pros, it's the, one of the pros is that it's a full image, it's ready to work, it's usually up to date, but on the con side is the enterprise version. So we couldn't use it. Why? Because the enterprise version is not meant to be used anywhere for free or give it away. It's just for customers who pay it. That's not really true, but that's more or less. <laughs> it's not yet there, so they are working on creating this, so it, it didn't fit my needs. So, so I looked at the community version for the same. Why? Because as we are Red Hat, we, open, we, we develop everything upstream first, and then we create the enterprise version out of it to sell it commercially. So the, this Atomic Developer Bundle was the upstream version of the CDK. As a pro, it was the community version, of course. That means that it was more suitable to use. It was the full image, ready to work, up to date, maintained, documented. But it has some things that I didn't like, like it requires some background plugins to set up for DNS, for uh, setting up the VM. And it was also, it's also a multi-purpose project. That means that is not only for OpenSea, but it's for a set of projects that we are creating in Red Hat, like Atomic Enterprise Platform, Nulacul, and something else. <coughs> so I didn't, I, I didn't think that it was tailored only for OpenSea, so we start digging more. There were more <coughs> demo environments available there out there, created by probably Red Hat consultants that whenever they go to customers, they have to create their own stuff. There were no pros from most of this. Why? Because it was the enterprise version, they were, on, they were not maintained once they, the guy did it. Uh, every time a new release come, they didn't maintain it, so it wasn't an option. And there was another thing that it, it looked really cool at the beginning, which is OpenShift in a container that's developed by a Red Hat engineer, and its community version. And it was really cool. Why? Because you have uh, you run it as a single command, so you do o o i n c o i n c o i n c, and you do up or run, and then you have an OpenShift installation. But the pro, the con, was that it wasn't it wasn't using a VM. So that's something to test on your host. I don't want people to pollute your their host. That's one of the main reasons. And also on Windows, it didn't work, of course, because of that. It was written in Go, it wasn't easy to understand, so that wasn't an option for us. And then we have the Fabricate, which is a, another upstream project from, from Red Hat. But this one, it was really cool. It's really good uh, VM with, for, for getting started with OpenShift. It's community version, and there is a lot of documentation, but then you have Fabricate on top, which is not what we wanted to show. So we wanted to show OpenShift, and Fabricate is adding a lot of stuff, cool stuff, to be honest. But that's not what I wanted to, to show. So none of this worked for me. Well, really, when I say me, I'm saying it didn't work for the team I work. And to be honest, it didn't work for just one guy who is the guy that talks the most and always complains. And you just saw him talking still. The only way to get me to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm promoting you. So yeah, if you want to follow him, that's he's very I'm chatty on, the, on, the, on, on Twitter. Don't follow me, I only have 38 followers. Don't do it. I don't say anything interesting. That's why I promote my colleagues. What we wanted, so we wanted, after doing this research, I had with a pretty understanding of what I was looking for to create a, a VM uh, for us. So I wanted to be based on the community version of OpenSea because we are developer advocates. We, uh, we want to promote the community version. I wanted to have the process that builds this VM, I want it to be open source. So to be easily accessible for everyone. So if you want to just change and adapt to your needs, we are Red Hat, we want to be open source and allow you to modify whatever you have. I want it to, be, to, to keep it up to date. So that means that with every release, we want it to be able to have it, to, to release one, one new version of this VM. It's not only the process that we are following to build this, uh, this uh, VM that is continually updated and keep up to date, but then out of this VM, we are creating uh, the, the pa a packaged VM that we ship 
or we promote in our openshift.org slash VM site. So that's the official VM that we promote as a, as a community version. We want it to be easy to understand so that anybody that looked at the code could understand it. So we didn't want to base it on Go or any other language that was really complex. We want it to be flexible in option, so whenever you create the, the VM, it could suit your needs. So if you want to do things like um, search or install a different branch of the code, you can do it easily. If you, did, if you wanted to add additional capabilities to the VM, it was easy to do it. So we, we created, or at least we think we have created it in a flexible way that allows you to provide with more capabilities or just the capabilities that you want for the VM. It's packageable. That means that we create the box that we ship in, in OpenShift.org. We ship it with this process. We create it with this process so that we eat our own dog food. Okay. We wanted to have the ability to peek into features in progress. That means that we talk constantly with engineers that they are developing in origin. But the only way, <coughs> the only way to look at whatever they have done is to build the latest code on the origin side the origin side, or even a branch they are working and they are trying to do a, a pull request or merge a pull request into, you need to do to build that and to create or install an OpenShift installation out of that. And that's really a hard process. So we wanted to just look at what they have done. So if we have any comment to make on the developer experience out of it, we could make it before it really gets into the product. We wanted to have the ability to pick, oh, that's that we just said. We wanted to be, be, be able to build it whenever we wanted. So that means that it's just a matter of, oh, I, I need to build a new version. You just run the build commands. It's, it's, it's uh, wrapped with Vagrant, and you just have an updated version. Of course, if you are building uh, OpenShift, it will need a big internet connection to pull down a lot of, a lot of things out, out of the internet. So I don't, I don't recommend to do it here today, but that's a, you can build it any, anyway. That's why I, I will show you some how it's been built, but I will use a video, and that's because the internet connection here sucks. And also it takes more time than it should. With a video I can slide fast forward. And we want it to be usable in different hosts. Why? Because developers, most of the developers usually use Windows, maybe not in this room but usually use Windows. So we wanted the VM to be usable in Windows, in Mac, or in Linux. So here I am presenting our own version of the Origins Vagrant VM that we're created. It is a CC app as doing a Vagrant app. Once you do Vagrant app and wait for a while, you'll get a full VM ready to work with OpenShift in it. There is no additional plugins required, so that means that Apart from, from Vagrant, and of course the virtualization technology that you are using, whether it's uh, VirtualBox or, or Libbit, you don't require anything else. There is no additional plugins required. You don't need anything for DNS setup. You don't need anything for configuring different technologies or whatever. Just Vagrant. There is no fancy port redirection. We are using the service CPIO, which is a hosted online service. So we use this service to be able to access our, the applications that you, you develop on OpenShift. That means that it's not suitable for working fully disconnected or not completing, so you will not be able to access the final application. You will be able to, access, to develop applications on top of OpenShift. But it works very easily, and there is no configuration. configuration. So it's fully configured for you. You don't require to do anything, but oh, on, on, and it's also fully maintained and supported by me and by the community that I hope it will become the <coughs> community. We have a lot of provisioning options. That means that if you want to customize things like the origin repo or branch to use, let's say that there is an engineer, Michael Fochik, and he's done something, and you see his pull request, you want to test it. So you just create the, 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 the vagrant, vagrant image or repro, reprovision the vagrant image with that repo, and you test his pull request. You can set up the VMIP. VM so if usually we ship with one IP, but it, if it conflicts with whatever network you are in, you can change it and, and adapt to your needs. And then all the ship IO and all this stuff will get 
uh, configure related to the IP you configure. It configures also the OpenShift domain for the applications. That means that you can provide whatever name, whatever uh, uh, domain you want for the applications, mm -hmm. and it allows you to specify what additional capabilities you want to add to the image. We'll see what are we working on, what additional capabilities we're working on, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of set of things, so you can, you can have a base image, and then you can have a base image created with a lot of stuff in it that's additional to OpenSheet itself. We have runtime options. Which runtime options you have? We have memory and CPU. That's it. You don't need to specify anymore. That means that if you create a VM and you package it and you provide it to anybody, the, the VM will work just by itself. It will be a very small background file, and they just need to tailor the memory and CPU to their needs. It works with libvirt and virtualbox because we wanted to be able to run in different uh, in different hosts for Windows, Linux, and, and Mac users. And it's a scripted in bash. That means that it should be easy for anybody to understand, to tweak, to change, modify, adapt, whatever they need. I have middleware background, and that's also one reason because I chose bash and not any other thing more complex like Perl, Python, Go, whatever mm -hmm. other scripting there is. I, there is the creation of the VM follows four simple steps, which is configure the OS layer, configure the Docker layer, configure the origin layer, and then provide with anything additional on top of that. On the OS, you install all, you can configure all the base packages that you want. We provide the minimum. You can, of course, tailor to your needs. And we try to make the image as small as possible. So we, things that are tunable in size or that can grow in time with, uh, in size, as we learn, we try to limit them, like the journal size. So we provide with a very small journal size because a developer usually will not look at the journal. So. The thing is that once you have a VM working, probably the journal starts growing and your VM starts behaving slower. slower. On, the on the Docker end, we just configure Docker and we start it. One thing what that we do is because we are using, as a, lo as a local um, environment, we are using the loopback um, um, file system because it's the easier one to set up. We limit the size for this loopback file system for the containers so it doesn't grow as much as your VM and it doesn't um, get to a, to a point where you cannot use the VM anymore. Then on the origin end it's as easy as go to the origin repo, whatever you have there, and check it out, check out, or update if you already have it with the latest that's, up, that's in, the, in the repo, build it, then configure origin, then start it, so you have the full VM with it started, and then add some services on top, like the OpenShift registry, the router, and some templates. So whatever is required to have a minimal installation ready to use for or by developers. And then we have an additional script that will grow within time that it will provide with additional capabilities to this base installation, things like the metrics. Maybe you don't need the metrics at all because you are a developer. So you can select whether you want to install it to have your VM with it or not. The logging capabilities, there is a centralized logging capabilities that's using the Elk stack. You may want to have it in your installation or not because uh, as you add things to the installation, the VM will get uh, bigger, the installation will run slower. Some templates, so we have the, the enterprise version of the templates if you want to use it for Demo in, in the enterprise, that's fine also. There is some work in progress to add, to add some additional users with different capabilities, with different roles and roles, so you can test things with different roles to, to show persistent volume capabilities using the NFS, so we'll set up an NFS server in the, in the VM. And then it also allows you to cache or to pull down all the images, so every time that you want to work, everything is already in your VM and you don't have to wait for different images to pull down from the internet. And bonus, we have some scripts that we are using to show OpenShift that we also put in there. So if you want to, let's say, show or try with a Nexus installation ready to work in an OpenShift environment, there is a script that it will just, you just have to run it 
and it will install a Nexus instance in your environment. And we are, a lot of the demos and the stuff that we do, we'll put it in there so you can just try it. <coughs> so now I have two videos. Uh, one it shows how to create a, how to create a, the VM from scratch. So I just pull down my, my GitHub repo and I do a big tab. I don't have to do anything else. And this will start doing following all the provisioning process. So it's creating and using libvirt for this one. And it's creating and just checking that I don't have anything running on that IP. And it's running all the scripts. So I will just, you'll see that it updates Fedora, it installs Docker, blah, blah, blah. It, this takes some time. Then we see that it's executing. So all these fancy members are for the, all the scripts that are run, whenever they are, they are run by Big Bang. Has these numbers, and then you'll see the execution of it. And then. So we are cloning Origin, we are building Origin, and then we are creating the service, and then we are creating the router, whatever, the base templates that are required. <laughs> and after we are installing some additional capabilities, and after we, we install all the additional capabilities, the installation will be up and running. We'll have a origin up and running in minutes. I have a decent internet connection at home. So this, for me, takes something like six minutes to build from nothing to a full OpenShift installation, <laughs> building from source code. And to be honest, the most time it takes is to install Docker and to build origin. Then this is the installation that you have. As you can see there, you have the IP that I'm accessing, the VM is the, it's already preset by me. And I'm going to create an application, and I'm going to, uh, and it's showing also what's the URL to access that application using the um, domain for the application that I provided at, at the setup time, which is the default one. So this is creating a PHP sample application with the sample repository. It's building it. Uh, you can see the logs, how it builds the application, and then, there, then you see that it's already been built, and then we can access the application. And this is here. This is the where your applications will be exposed, and this is why you require an internet connection. But at the end, if you are using or building something in, in Origin, you will require an internet connection because you will be pulling down dependencies probably for your application. So that's something that we assume it was something required, but we prefer to use this way. And now, I don't know what's doing now. And now we see that we have, a, in this VM, oh, it's doing it again. This is the application itself. And then what we see here is that it also has the metrics capability, so that's something additional, usually not installed by default. If you want to see the metrics, because you are you, the application that you want to, you are developing, you want to have this kind of ability, you can just add it. And then you can just log in with the regular command line to the VM, and it will just work with the OC client, as some of you have seen in previous uh, workshops this morning. Okay. And there is there is um, there is the, this uh, other option when you want you have already your you have already your VM uh, created, but you just want to test some capabilities. You don't need to go again and create the VM again from scratch because that will take a lot of time. So you just run the provisioning step with the VM. So this is a, another video that I have. So what I do is, I was looking at this pull request from Fabiano Franz for a, for a new feature that was going to go into the product. So it, it, the, this feature, what it does, 
it's at a, an about box here that it will allow you to download the client from the, from the web console. So I wanted to test it. How do I test it? I just reprovision the VM with the repo username of the whoever is doing the commit and the uh, branch. So this is something that you'll get in the pull request. In the, whenever you are watching to a pull request, you'll get this, this information and you just background provision instead of a grant app because your, your box is already running. You just say, okay, let's reprovision this. It takes some time that I will skip. And so once you access the, the VM, you can see what he's done. Okay. This is this is whatever he's done. So this is a, a way of having the latest and greatest or checking whatever you want to check of what the developers have done. So during this process, at the beginning I, I told you what things we needed, what, what were the requirements that we needed for the VM. We wanted to be open source, so this is this is hosted on GitHub, so you can use it and access and, and tune it and modify it. We, want, we wanted it to be based on the community version that's using the origin. We want it to be maintained up to date. It's maintained up to date because we are using it to create our own VM. So that's why we are keeping it up to date. We have a, some we have to provide this level of quality. It's easy to understand because it's written in bash. It's flexible in provisioning and option, although it, you don't have a lot amount of provisioning option, but it's you can do some provisioning. You can package it. So there is some one way. From, once you create this installation, you can just do a vagrant box package and create with a VM, one VM that you can reuse with everything that you have set. So it's, it will just create, a, it start with a, with the VM fully configured. That's what we do for the OpenShift or VM. You can, you can look into features in progress. How I just saw, so. Um, you can build it whatever you want and you can use it in different hosts. So check it out please. It's there is a there is a that's the link to the repo. Mm -hmm. Or use the package version. Uh, don't worry, there is a link to the to the slide at the end. Uh, where you can get all the presentation, links to the videos and everything. So use use the package version if you want. That's our version in the openzip.org side and read or read the usage docs. So for the VM that we provide in the in the origin site, we also provide with the lab something similar to what Grant has done in the in the during the morning that can help you walk through all the usage of um, OpenShift. So creating an application, hooking one one application uh, or linking one application with the database, deploying templates, what's templates and all this stuff. So don't kill me if you don't like it. <laughs> Just do some pull requests, submit issues, help us make it better. Or just don't use it, of course. Thank you for, for listening me, to me. And if you have questions, just now is the time for them. And if you want this presentation, it's there. So this is the only link that you really care because all, all the other links are, are in there. Thank you. Questions? Come on! There are no questions? I have a question. Please. Okay, but, good. Uh, how do you do the libvirt provider? Because on the link there's only VirtualBox uh, provider published. We don't, we don't provide yet the packaged VM for libvirt. We are working on that. But if you are using the libvirt provider or you want to use the libvirt provider, just clone the GitHub repo and take it up. You will have it. As long as you have the libvirt configured for Vagrant, it will work. That's it. I think we have an issue filed for, for that particularly, so hopefully soon. Yeah, we have an issue to publish the VM with Libre on the origin side. Okay, so it works. the person who makes the VM, now that Jorge has made his script, it's basically all I do to make that VM, honestly, is I run his script, I do a little bit of like cleaning the file system with like writing it all to blank so that Vagrant can compress it when it packages it, I and I make a new Vagrant file, and that's it. 
Yeah. So there's and the, there is instructions on the readme file. Yeah. So if you go to the repo, there is instruction on how to create your own package version of <laughs> Ryan Little. Yes. Uh, what's your uh, maintenance uh, policy against, uh, against OpenShift? Uh, so probably uh, when I will use your master, I always get something relatively new, yeah. right? And you will continuously uh, go to the next or um, the, 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 the master of OpenShift. Yeah. Uh, but I, if I wanted something more stable, like OpenShift uh, 3.2 or something like that, do you have branch or so this is this is origin this is not uh, enterprise so 302 is the version for the enterprise but it relates to some version of origin the thing is that what we are doing is because we are maintaining it we are keeping it up to date to the newest releases so probably within time if you um, if you want to use like last year's origin you will have to go back in comments for last year's so version of branches or no, we have releases we do releases for origin so yes. release. On, if you navigate to GitHub, there is a releases tab. If you click, you have you will see like 30 releases or something. So those, pro those yeah. correspond to tags. Yeah. So basically, if I go when I'm building the all in one VM based on origin, I go into his script and hit in his script, you can set an environment variable for what tag you, you can set both the repo and you can set the, the tag branch. or branch. Okay, so and I can find those. And, uh, yeah. I so what we'll, we'll, we'll be doing. That's something that it's good that we should have this session because we'll get some ideas. Right now, it's only it's, there is only one master branch, but what we will be doing is every release that we publish on the origin side, we will tag it so you can go back to that official version and use the 1.1.1 .1 release of origin. Right now, if you just clone the origin side, you can run master or you can just specify as I did. When I did for this branch, you can say, Origin branch ma master or origin branch version <coughs> what dot what dot dot one and you'll have the one dot one dot one version. The only thing is that it will not get it from the package version. It will build it for you out of that branch. Mean, <coughs> but do you using ANSI installation? There is no, we are not using ANSI installation. There is, uh, yeah, there is, and uh, there is uh, RPMs for for OpenShift origin. In OpenShift repo is an installer repo. There is an installation for OpenShift. As far as I know, that's on, uh, only for Fedora 23. No, it's, it's for uh, as well. For? It's for CentOS 11 as well. Okay, then. But, so here's the deal. The real remember one of his points was we as the evangelists wanted to test features when they were going in. Your RPM solution doesn't work for us. No. Because we. It's, it's, it's a red hat. But that yeah. still doesn't matter because I can't go and then say, ah, uh, Mikhail has done a new, he's testing a new feature. I want to actually, I, I want, I don't even want tip. I want Mikhail's branch where he's checking in all sorts of stuff that might be broken. This script is generic enough. It builds from source, right? So we don't want the RPMs because we want to build from source. So we either build from, a, in my case, when I build the all-in-one PM, I build from a tagged version that was released like v1.1.1, and then I can link that to clients. But when I'm testing Mikhail's stuff, I want to build from his source tree to build an all a vagrant image. So the RPM, we don't use RPMs or anything packaged, yeah. we don't use Ansible, none of that stuff. So this is, this is something that we created for us, because we had a need, that's the whole presentation was our need, okay? And probably it's not the best way. We are not engineers, we are not uh, doing the, the proper approach. But we had a solution that worked for us. If it works for you, which I just explained, then fine, use it. If it doesn't work, use whatever you want. If you do want notes on Ansible, we have a separate set of links yes. for, for staging up a cluster of machines. But that's a different repo. Than you, yeah, yeah, it's available. Yeah. And the point of this also is not to set up a cluster. The point well, of this is all one, one all VM that runs everything you want that you can easily just do stuff with. You don't get into all that DNS stuff. It's just one VM running, and it acts like an entire server. More questions? Then yeah. you are relieved from me. Thank you.
So we have one hour, something like that, to how we start making the trip. Well, we, we made a break. Good, good. Okay. Because we move as a team, we made a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But this is important, when you say see I see the yeah, yeah. I'm following your stuff as well. Even as good as you can do. Let's meet at the uh, the booth. Okay. Okay. This is the Ansible installer okay. to set up your own environment in Amazon or Google Compute Engine or on, or on bare metal. If you have a cluster of machines that you want, you can have a, something called an inventory file that just has a list of IP addresses. And as long as you have a valid SSH key, to, to access, it'll go log into all the IPs, use Ansible to provision a, a cluster of maybe 10 machines. So I ran a command. Okay. Is there any way for the local environment to communicate by like pushing all the changes to all the machines? Ansible, are you banning something? If, if I. The best way to do that, once you have, uh, if you've already built an image, then you just do Docker push. Okay. Docker push. Yeah, yeah. And then hopefully the uh, you have an image stream that runs and it fires in the any time a new image arrives. And the deployment thing they will listen to that event and then possibly do a deploy based on what they're deploying. So for CI or staging, I always auto deploy. For production, I maybe wait until they press the button and then manually deploy for production. But whenever I have a, a safe time, right? And for building the image, you have to do it locally, like like. 
come out. Well, we already have. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'd use OpenShift to build it locally, so I, I, uh, I could use OC Sync um, okay. into the environment, yeah. or I could actually. Uh, there's a variety of ways uh, to, to build locally. Yeah, maybe OC Sync. If I was using a hosted environment, I would just do a Git push to GitHub. That GitHub would listen, good. yeah, listen for that hook. That would do a build in the cloud, okay. and it would should produce the same image, okay. right? It should, right? Uh, it should be theoretically, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. A <laughs> it's but on the other hand, I could have a a base okay. builder image on my laptop with CentOS, and then maybe what they build in staging is on rel, right? Maybe they don't want to pay too many rel licenses. I get sent to us here, rel in the cloud, right? I still can build Docker images. I can push and pull Docker images based on CentOS, but when they go to production, it's rel, right? So uh, nice to, to have uh, different ways of producing the images and allowing people to uh, enforce a standard base for, for compliance and consistency across uh, your environment. Yeah,
Should we prepare something before or? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Just I mean, I mean, come and just improvise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just improvise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it has to be good because I need to know to lock to uh, my speak. Yeah, because you know, when, when I'm when I'm speaking, it will be uh, 2 p.m. So yeah, it's just time to learn something. Great, great start.